Okay, I think I'm recording. Medieval bestiaries, or how to have fun with your ignorance. I thought I'd start off with one that I mentioned casually to you already, and that is one of my favorites, and that is the Bonicon. And this little paragraph points out that where most of the beasts in medieval bestiaries are associated with Christian moral allegory, the Bonicon is set apart from these, however, because it has no moral attached to its story. Its representation is purely comical, or at least we might imagine. Here is a Bonicon, and the Bonicon is a beast that, when hunted, will fling fire from its anus. They even devised special shields with long swords to hunt Bonicons, supposedly. I have a few examples. Here's somebody shooting an arrow through the Bonicon, and you see the fire coming out there. And yet another one, and here you see the extra long weapon being used to hunt the Bonicon because of it, the danger of its um, fiery poo. It's distinguished, I think, it's got the cloven hooves, the curly horns, the mane of a horse, and the hind end of a, I forget the, the reference there. And jumping here to the beast that I also mentioned casually that <clears throat> were thought to live sort of at the periphery of the flat earth. And this is an otherwise human creature, but only one leg and one giant foot. But that one foot could be used as an umbrella. Isn't that nice? <laughs> and this is, of course, an old print. Most of what I'm showing you in this lecture are from illuminated manuscripts. But this one is actually a print. Um, this is uh, actually probably made at the late medieval, what you might call early Renaissance, this is probably Northern European, which is uh, kind of started to receive some of the notions around Renaissance a little bit later than Southern Italy, especially Italy, Southern um, Europe, I mean, especially Italy. I won't know uh, lots of details about each one of these. And to me, that's not necessarily the point. As an artist, I am a defender of sometimes being somewhat ignorant of what we are looking at and to fill in the gaps with our own imagination. Um, I believe in responsible knowledge and the power of knowledge and research, but I also believe in the power of the imagination. Crocodiles were known but not seen in Europe. They would live in North Africa, but they were all often shown as eating humans. For they're, they're shown as kind of ferocious beasts. I have a few different crocodiles, like this one. So it, they knew it lived in water. So, oh, okay, it must look kind of like a fish, but it's also got legs. Okay, and then why is the mouth kind of upside down and the eyes on the ground? I have no idea. Yet another interpretation of a cock, uh, crocodile. You know, the these illuminated manuscripts were made generally by monks, sometimes directly for or under the patronage of royalty, but not exclusively. And so these were scribes and image makers kind of by trade that spent their entire life kind of cooped up in what was called the scriptorium and the scriptorium is kind of a Latin word for the writing room, literally. Um, printing in Europe is not invented until 
the mid 1400s most of these images are coming from before that so if you wanted books you needed human hands to copy those um, I think the boredom in some cases the poverty of being cooped up in these monasteries kind of has an effect on what these images end up looking like. And, you know, and it, the ostensible subjects of all of these images are the beasts, but it's really good to notice the other things too. Notice the trees that you see and the way the trees are stylized. Notice the sky and how it's sort of night and there are these stars coming out but the way they do these marks uh, and the way they do the fading there notice these the hill the texture on the hill and even the way they organize the composition and provide sort of a context of landscape it's uber simple but remarkably effective some of these are really teeny too they're like little tiny details on this much larger page of, of calligraphic text. I have no idea about this beast, um, and it may not even have a specific name. Uh, you have all this stuff that's painted into the margins of the books that might be referred to as marginalia. Um, and it's, it's often irreverent, silly, um, a little gruesome sometimes, fanciful, sometimes even sexual in nature. <clears throat> the tree here is really odd, these two trees. The human face obviously has taken a leg from a human. The human face on this creature, it's got claws like a lion, mane like a lion, but then this face of a, of a man and this funny hat. This background decorative thing is really interesting too. And this weird, I'm not sure, the, the lines make me think it's supposed to be water Maybe it is, but the color seems odd for water. Believe it or not, this one is actually a beaver, these two creatures here. And the beaver was thought to, when hunted, when trapped, that it would, it would bite off its own testicles as an offering to the hunters in order to, to escape with its life. And so here's one who is in the process of biting off his own testicles, and here's one whose testicles have already been bitten off, he's bleeding, and here's the testicles in the hunter's hands. And he's looking at his friends going, hey, look what I've got, I've got my testicles for the day, I'm done. And the dogs are like, oh, those testicles look good. This one, I wish that uh, I was giving this lecture in class because I would offer a quiz or a, uh, a guessing game as to what beast this is. And the clue is that this beast is totally uh, a known beast that you um, would, would know about today. This is an oyster. <laughs> oh my god, it's so charming and funny. And evidently oysters were thought to have beaks. Go figure. Again, this is marginalia of a, of a larger text. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, but it sure is funny. You know, so this P comes down and becomes the arrow that was shot by this guy right in the bum of a merman, as if a merman had a bum. <laughs> he doesn't seem upset about it. Um, notice too the faintly visible image of antlers and sort of um, antelope, not antelope, but uh, another kind of 
um, elk or something creature here with decorative marks and some element there. And then you see a bit of a bird claw here and a bit of a body of a bird coming up here and some other decorative elements there. Generally, this paper would have been true parchment, which is a tanned leather. It's an animal skin. Uh, this is before the invention of paper. Those scriptoriums where the monks worked that I mentioned, they would not always have a good regular source for parchment. And what could happen, and happened frequently, is a traveling monk would come through with a certain number of books, or some traveler would come through with books. The monks at that monastery would decide that they needed a copy of one of those books, but they had no clean parchment. What they would do is they would take a book that they had that they would deem less important and they would literally scrape away everything that was on that parchment. But of course, scraping it away, it wouldn't erase it 100%. You'd still see faint amounts of it. And then on top, they would make a copy of the book they wanted, adding all this stuff. There's a specific name for such a book or a surface that has been treated in that way, and it is palimpsest, P-A-L-I-M-P-S-E-S-T, palimpsest. And it's when you have multiple iterations of a surface visible at once, showing its history and age. Here is an elephant towering above the trees. That's a really funny snout. One of the best pieces of advice I might offer you and you trying to come up with your own beast is forget what you know, particularly about these beasts or about any beast that you might find familiar. Part of the whole point of this project is to seek the unfamiliar and arrive at the unfamiliar. Hedgehogs. I think the idea here is that the hedgehogs would go, would come out of their hole and would roll around on the ground beneath the trees that are dropping fruit or nuts. The fruit or the nut, the food, would get lodged in the hedgehog's fur and then the hedgehog goes back in its hole and collects the food from its fur. It's pretty ingenious. And this you might think is just simply a large fish but it really is a marine animal, a marine beast that according to the legend is so huge that Mariners would mistake it for an island. And what you're seeing here is a boat that has sailed up next to this giant beast, this giant fish or whale, and has tied up to it and built a fire on it and has a cauldron and they're starting to cook. And then suddenly the fish is like, whoa, what's going on? And and then the whale, the fish whale destroys and kills everybody. Not sure what's going on in this one, but it, it looks charmingly uh, fun and intimate, like these um, two creatures are best friends or even something more. Here is a phoenix rising out of the flames. This one is not actually medieval, but I put it in here um, because it's awesome.
This one is not specifically European. This gets into um, the Near East or Persian. But there was similar kinds of activity. There was cultural crossover between what was then Persia um, and Europe. And there was even shared knowledge. It's not talked about as much, but uh, particularly it Italy had a lot of commerce and interaction with not only the Ottoman Turks, but with Persia as well, and other peoples on the eastern part of the Mediterranean moving east from what is today Israel. Here's another example from that area. Don't know anything about this beast. I just love the way it looks. I even love it in relation to the frame that provides the space of the text. The fact that the tongue sticks out there, the tail sticks out very far. Another Persian one. Snakes on the head similar to a Medusa kind of idea, but in this case, I'm not sure we can deduce gender here, but the body is certainly that of a fish, the head of a human with very sharp teeth. Another Persian one. This guy looks very gentle. He doesn't look like he hurt anybody. He just likes he just looks like he's happy to spend all day every day gardening. Uh, I wish I could tell you what's going on here, but I really can't. Now this is actually getting into the Mughal Empire, which is more like present-day India. Um, but something funky is going on. There's kind of maybe a feast of fishes, but uh, there's definitely looking like both genders are, I mean, according to humans, two, at least two genders are happening, and, and it's, a, it's a party. Here's a little snippet of European medieval stained glass that has these beasts. When you look at architecture from the Gothic medieval period, um, you see these things everywhere. They're sticking out of the tops of columns. They're sticking in they're in little corners of the stained glass and the mosaics, and um, they're just all over the place. Also, and very, you know, a lot of times you can't fully identify them. You might not even know is there a specific symbolic value or meaning to them. Again, this is a very early print. So this is probably about mid, about 1450 or so. The, the print is a woodcut and it's printed in black. And the color is a stencil process. So they would literally cut out a stencil, place it on the piece of paper and daub in the color. So really crude, really simple. This one is not also not medieval, but I included it just because I like the image so much. I love the way this mound of earth is sort of a stand-in for an extended landscape. Same with these. You can sort of see people just, I mean, sometimes you see them trying to fill their lives with a little bit of humor, but sometimes you can really just see them trying to make sense of things they have seen, things that they have heard about but not seen, things that they believe exist even though they haven't seen or don't have evidence of, and they're trying to take all this weirdness and make sense of it which is a very human problem. I mean, we're all trying to make sense of kind of the life that we're, that we're experiencing. And, and, you know, and so there are people who are born in all sorts of ways. And, 
And so in some ways, this is just trying to make sense of that. Like, why? Um, and what does that mean? And, and, and how do we make a compendium of, of all the possible creatures out there and all the permutations? I love this one. So odd. Yeah, this one too. This is going back to Persia now. Look, it's another palimpsest. Something was erased before these were drawn on. This just looks like a strange cocktail party. You know, like you could put martini glasses in their hands. Everybody's just standing around trying to think of something to say. Another early woodcut European. A sort of attempt to document known fishes, but to do so fairly inadequately too. <laughs> Did you know there's a fish that looks like an owl and has a beak? Maybe there is. There's a fish where a little woman rides it. <laughs> this detail, as you might imagine, you can sort of tell is really tiny. A real sense of humor in how the text would interact with the image occasionally. <laughs> I just love this face. And look, I, he's, I think he's bitten off part of her garment. And she's like, that's okay, you can have it. <laughs> This one's also not European. Oh, that's it. 